I'm very excited to talk to you all. Um, it's been really cool seeing like everyone's reaction as it's been posted, especially because I obviously know the truth about what's happening. Um, and it's been really fun seeing like um, people in the on Tumblr and stuff who are like get, guessing stuff early or getting stuff wrong. Um, I don't know which is more fun. I think it's more fun when everything um, you all go on off on the red herrings and don't get stuff right. But well, um, I, I, it's, it's great either way. Just seeing like how you pick up on stuff that I've left as little clues. So. I wanted to talk um, to you all and just like like discuss it because I wanted to get into all the spoilery stuff. So I'm just going to go through some questions and then talk a little bit about uh, all the stuff that I uh, was thinking when I was putting it in. So to start with, did I know the ending when I started writing it? Kate has asked. Um, so I didn't know the that it was going to end the way it did. So I started it in 2017 and before this started I just went through my old notes to see how much I had get, like written out in advance and I knew that the, the actor that she was obsessed with would have a terrible past but I didn't know what was going to be revealed uh, about that so I was kind of like predicting that the, the so originally it was going to be uh, her mum was like originally friends with the actor and her mum had this live journal history with them and so as she un unveiled this stuff it revealed all this stuff about her mum. Um, so part of like what was going on was that the more she learnt the more terrible things she learnt about her parents as well as this actor and all this scandalous stuff her mum was getting up to and then I th um so th the kind of like the history stuff between the fangirl and the actor was there from like the, the family side of it but the more I went on the more fun I thought it would be to like have it would actually be the uh, the fangirl who knew the actor and uh you like she is she she knows everything and it's the reader who doesn't know what's true and is kind of picking stuff up as it goes along so that was a lot of fun um to like think about how i could reveal stuff to the reader and because it, it needs to be clear from the beginning that the the what you're reading is unreliable so you have to find a way to tell the readers that this is not going to be true and you should be paying a lot of attention to what you're reading uh so I had to think of it, like I had to put in some things that she Gotti could get called on for being a lie so that then you can see oh she's lying about certain stuff but what big stuff is she lying about so that was a lot of fun so from the point of view of like uh I I knew that there were going to be a lot of secrets and I knew that the fangirl would was aware of more stuff than she was telling you and then from there I had to kind of uh just go for it because a lot of the start the start is just standard um fan discourse so i had a structure in place because it was going to follow like the steps of a conspiracy theory in fandom um posting and then i had to find ways to weave in the real life plot and i think that was probably the most difficult part was that often when you read those things there's not stuff happening in real life with the actors um like some some very active fandoms uh, like in k-pop they'll have like daily updates of what the um the people they're obsessed with are doing so you can see stuff on a daily basis but for most of the time the evidence that they have in like a ship manifesto might be a couple of years out of date so the fact that it was all I, she was looking at stuff that was like happening in, happening in a courthouse that day um it was really hard to find ways to put that in subtly um without it being really obvious that that was a clue because it was the only thing happening in the current day um so yeah so the first things i was doing was establishing that you can't trust gotti um but also i had to establish that some of what she was saying was true so there were some things in there that um like were real and that there was evidence that you could follow to like the twitter accounts to prove that that was real um so you didn't just dismiss everything but it was it was a lot of fun and i ended up making these massive spreadsheets where it was like a column of what you got was telling you and then a column for what was true and what wasn't and then <laughs> trying to go through it all um so 
for I think it it changes at halfway through because at the point where Gotti goes into their house she has only got one incentive which is to work out what's going on with Rob and after that point she her incentive changes because she's not only trying to work out what's going on with Rob she's trying to like change um what you think about what happened when she went in the house right she's she's suddenly involved herself and she's put herself in the narrative and so regardless of whether you think she murdered nathan or not she has got to prove that she didn't because even if she didn't like she <laughs> it was there <laughs> and someone could come out and accuse her of it so she would always immediately had to be on the defensive to stop anyone making that accusation um so there were <laughs> she's definitely a strategist she'd be very good as like an army general i think um but it was really fun trying to work out how to show that <laughs> and make sense of it all <laughs> um what, so what have we got <laughs> how many columns were needed for when she's going to admit to something later but it isn't the actual truth and she's very slithering yeah um so there was definitely stuff that she was like seeding in early because she was going to admit to it later that um maybe wasn't true but she was she needed to lay the groundwork for herself but that was a lot of fun uh so clovella asks <laughs> clovella is a perfect name that's from the last beginning if you haven't read that um so does delilah ever find out what happened so delilah um so i was saying in the very first version gotti was uncovering stuff about her parents uh delilah is gonna have that bit of the storyline uh I've moved it over to her so it's going to be Delilah who's uncovering stuff that's happening to her parents um so I'm not entirely sure yet but I think what's going to happen is Delilah is obviously she's got two very famous parents and uh after Nathan's death um Lock and Ness obviously got cancelled because the main actor was dead and the other one was in prison and then a few decades later it gets rebooted and if you read loneliest girl in the universe romy uh is in about 2035 2030 something like that she's watching um the reboot of Loch and ness and so delilah will find out what happens um because her parents were involved in this mysterious event and she's gonna uh start doing some stuff there um but who knows what will happen there i haven't written it <laughs> Oh, where was the body for three weeks? It was it was in the closet. Um, yeah, so you can decide who put it there, but it was just hiding in there in the office, uh, which is not great. <laughs> um, so how were the names of the characters decided on? Uh, do you mean the names of the characters or the, na the usernames? So the character names, uh, I was trying to go for very, like, all of the actors that seem to get people obsessed about them have those kind of very all-American names like Rob Hennings and Nathan O'Donnell so I was trying to go for that vibe and then um, Gotti I really wanted a name that felt like it could be infamous like Miss Scribe is like a very memorable username and um, I wanted like a Gotti Writes to be <laughs> like iconic um, and then uh, people are asking about her surname so Gotti's surname is Garcia and there is a publicist called Millie Garcia uh, who works uh, for NBC on Loch Ness so she is involved in what Rob and Nathan tell the world and um, I knew from the beginning that the minute I had this fangirl investigating that people would think that she was part of the NBC team um, so I had to establish that um, she was not like getting inside information um so i put in a red herring of like people in the comments <laughs> thinking that she was related to the publicist because of her last name which is a very common last name was um uh like she was had a connection there and they, then she could like deny that in the comments but that was one of those things that was like put in there to make the reader think about how unreliable Gotti might be um so it was a bit of a red herring but I think 
there are so many red herrings in there I, if i went through it i could be like and that's a red herring and that's a red herring um it's really interesting what which ones people have picked up on uh, everyone always is really suspicious about anya and as delilah's investigations start uh, maybe that will become true or not obviously brad has a bit of a connection but uh there might be more going on there about how deeply involved brad actually was we'll have to see dan asks how did i decide what format it would be released in so obviously like the first thing that came to mind was that it was going to be like written in um posts and it was going to be put online as if she was posting this blog um and i've just been obsessed with these kind of fan essays and the, the format they take for so long, like I read Miss Scribe's um, fan essay when I was, I, I must have been like 16 uh, and I remember it happening. So it's part of my like, my brain <laughs> at this point. Um, and I think it's such an interesting structure because it's, it's halfway between like historical document and write up and just like, weird storytelling like they are so interesting to read because you can see that the person writing it is invested in getting convincing other people of the truth because if they stop believing that this is true then everything they've put their time in, and investment in like researching is just going to fall apart so you need to um really convince yourself in writing a fan essay as much as anyone else because otherwise like what are you doing with your life um so they're they're really you can tell that the person writing it has this kind of um incentive there and they're they're working really hard and um there's some there's a great one i think it's called the harry louis treatise um about uh harry and louis from one direction and all the way through the writer is like i don't ship them i don't ship them like stop saying that and then like it's about whether they're dating or not and they're like no they're not dating but like i don't ship them and i don't read fic but obviously they're dating this is just like i could just wander off the street and i think they were dating and it's so biased because they've clearly like to get to the point where they're so invested that they're writing an essay they've really had to like twist up their brain and convince themselves that they're more interested in like the business side of like how unfair it is and immoral it is that the 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 band are um like lying about their relationship and this they just want for the moral reason they want this truth to come out and so um that was the kind of what i want why i chose the format because i wanted to there's not a way you can have do that in in like prose book in a novel you can't have a character have so many complex motivations about just why they're doing writing this down like you could like you can't be, be in someone's head and have them be convinced that they're lying to themselves about why they're doing this and there's just so many layers there that i've never seen anyone do anything with like these things are kind of infamous on the internet um people have heard of these conspiracy theories but there's not like a book about them and there should be <laughs> because it's so interesting so the format was the thing that drew me in like the plot itself could have gone in any direction it didn't have to be a murder mystery um it didn't even have to be a thriller but i wanted to write about fandom and about those layers of um believing in stuff and convincing yourself you believe in stuff and how everybody has different perspectives like i would love if i was going to write a, another perspective it would be the internal email memos going back and forth between millie garcia and nbc because millie garcia is obviously she's got an in with fandom in that she's sending out like little bits of news to the update twitters and trying to change the narrative herself so she i think is the most similar to Gotti in that she's actively trying to change this story of what's being told and believed. And I think that I think that companies like NBC or the Star Wars team or whatever are a lot more deeply involved in fandom than we realise because they're guiding like the fans in certain directions and they're creating content that they want to see. I mean, if you look at 
The Witcher on Netflix, the character of Yaskira is such a small character in the show, but the fans have picked up on him so much that all of the Netflix content is now around Yaskira because they're clearly the publicists are involved in fandom and they are um, guiding the fandom to make that a bigger thing. And I would love to be a, right about being one of those publicists because that's such an interesting job especially if there's a murder going on within the fandom that your job is about watching so yeah that was why I wrote the format sorry these answers are really really long <laughs> this might go on for a while um so M asked how much have I planned out originally and what were the most difficult aspects to write um so I planned out um them up to the murder um and like i found it really hard to find ways to show what was happening in real life so once i knew there was going to be a murder i had to find a way to like actually have a murder where it like because gotti can only write stuff up afterwards um so that's why there are a lot of like live streams and stuff which was really difficult uh it sounds obvious like have a live stream and have the audio transcript of the live stream but it was really hard to find a way to do that um, and like show what was really happening alongside then later what Gotti said was happening so up to, that was something that I had to come back to so I planned out a lot and then I got to the murder and I was like I don't know how I'm going to show the murder yet but I know what's going to happen after the murder um, so I then went on and wrote more of that and then I came back and did more plotting because so much of the structure is like an essay it was quite easy to shift stuff around as I plan my my plans changed and um, there were a few different versions of like who died like I think I don't think there was a version where Gotti died but there was definitely a version where you thought someone had died and then it turned out to be someone else um, I need to go back and look but because I needed a way whether the story could carry on after the death it, it couldn't be um, like there had to be someone that died and then there had to be someone else carrying on the blog oh there was definitely a version where it was Gotti who died and then Rob's carried on the blog so you thought that Gotti was the one making those posts and then um, it turned out instead that the last 15 entries were all written by Rob and that he'd murdered her. Um, there was a, a version where Gotti um, discovered the body out in the woods because um, she tracked someone's phone, I think, and went and dug, literally dug up a body that someone had buried and then had to find out who'd buried it. So it was like, it was, it was interesting to try and find a way to make it work. Um, because there was like it's not just a thriller in that there's a murder that's happened it's a thriller in that the more interesting part is what how people use the the narrative of like internet myths to change what actually happened according to what they want people to think um so all of those things were really difficult and made it <laughs> really tough but yeah it's about like building a, um and a, a building a, a change in how you want people to think about an event and that's obviously exactly what publicists do they try to make sure they're controlling the narrative and that's why it's such an interesting thing to do it in fandom <laughs> someone says that it's a shame it wasn't Gotti and I should have killed her Gotti is the one the most chaotic feral character in this she's the one driving all this she held on to a feud for <laughs> however many years like <laughs> five years and then went in and made her revenge happen so none of this would have taken place if it wasn't for Gotti. i love her <laughs> even though like i designed her to be an unlikable character because i wanted her to be terrible because obviously if she's nice there's it's not interesting she's not going to do terrible things and you can't ever believe that she would do terrible things um yeah she was a lot of fun to write as a bad buddy and in my next book, The Reckless Afterlife of Harriet Stoker, um, I've got another like terrible female character. <laughs> I really like unlikable female characters like Fleabag. <laughs> I've written so many Fleabags recently because <laughs> um, they're more interesting, right? They're doing stuff that is uh, really fun because they don't have any morals and they're not worried about whether people want to punch them or not. <laughs> um, 
<clears throat> so what was the experience of writing it like? So quick, I wrote it because it is like an essay. It's not like you have to think about dialogue and pacing. You can literally just type it out like a self-righteous Tumblr post. Um, and I had like a list because I knew I was going to write it about six months in advance of actually sitting down and writing it. Um, I had a list of all the jokes that I wanted to include. So whenever I was online, I, if I saw a funny meme or a username or someone getting in a stupid argument, I'd like copy and paste it into a bullet point list. And then I had all of those that I could include as I was like working as I was writing. So it was super easy to write because I was always like, but I need to get in this joke about like what people do in the One Direction fandom. I'd better have Gotti talk about this because then I can use that. And so it was a lot of fun. And then so that the first draft, I think I wrote about 30,000 words in a week. And then it took a long time to actually put in all of the plot afterwards once the structure was there because I had to it was kind of like proof of concept because um, I tried to explain what I wanted to do to like my agent and she, she would just had no idea like she couldn't even advise me on how it, whether it would work because it was just so impossible to explain the concept without actually doing it so I had to write it out and then be like this is what I meant what do you think and then I could go in and add the plot so um I'm trying to think what her advice was on the first draft she, I remember she said that um Gotti it's hard Gotti isn't needs to be more proactive so what one of the, the first draft she wasn't it wasn't her that was in had this history with Robin fandom it was her mum so she was at the start she was literally she had no motive except she wanted to talk about these guys that she thought were dating and so you could tell that because it wasn't there was no drive so um I had to go back and add in like all this stuff that you could see behind the scenes was where it was leading with the fact that there was going to be a murder through the courtroom documents and stuff um so that was quite hard uh so ellie asks who posted the last comment in the finale uh I, you know i can't tell you that <laughs> um the whole point is that you don't know um but i think it's very clear that Rob has been leaving a lot of comments anonymously all the way through this blog and in the past he has a history of like using sock puppet accounts and faking discussions and plenty of people in prison these days have access to the internet so I don't think you can disqualify it from being him because he was in prison but I'm not saying that it was him it could have been Delilah it could have been Brad or Anya it could have been Gotti herself maybe like she got to 20 years and she knew that she was safe and she just had to tell someone the truth. It could have just been someone who hated Gotti and thought she was really unlikable um, and thought she deserved to go to prison and wanted this to all come out. It could be NBC who were about to launch a reboot of Lock and Ness and wanted to restart this hype. So they posted something stupid about Gotti, who they had knew had disappeared, actually being responsible. But I, and I'm not going to say that everything in that last comment is true, because I don't think it is. Uh, I think it's a good theory that some mysterious person has left. Uh, by the way, I haven't decided who wrote that comment yet either. Um, I, I'm going to wait and and decide when I do some more writing. I've got a few theories, um, but I, I need to see <laughs> who who's playing the long game here because <laughs> um, Brad and Anya, I think, are a lot more involved than they say. Um, but yeah, so it could be anyone. And I think that it's not all true, and but there are some parts of it that are true. Um, and you'll have to decide for yourself what whether you think that situation is very likely knowing that the body was actually left in a cupboard for so many weeks and you've seen like rob rob's done a few live streams and been caught on camera talking to gotti a few times so you've had the words from his mouth but we do know that he has a history of hating gotti and that whatever he says to her has a lot of uh, other things going on there um I love Rob and Gotti and them, their, their history of talking like ever since like Gotti was 13 and just swapping theories about fan hate on LiveJournal and then like still being friends now. Um, yeah, I think 
that if they were reunited, which I hope I will get to reunite them one day, <laughs> they would still find that they get on really well because they have so much mutual history and interest in like conniving fandom drama that I think that if they reunited against someone that would be so fun. <laughs> I would love to see how they could take over the world. Um, Phoebe asks, uh, I mentioned previously that I had an idea of exploring the fandom through several generations. Was Delilah going back to do the podcast supposed to be reminiscent of that? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So Delilah, um, I'm, I'm hoping I get to write a bit, a bit more of this story when it gets turned into a novel, which I'm still working on. Just because the format at the minute is you you wouldn't you couldn't go into a bookshop and open a book and have the first page be a fandom essay. Um, you have to ease readers into it and explain the concept with like a normal kind of uh, prose writing that you get in a traditional novel. So I've got to go and add in some kind of prose. So hopefully it will be Delilah's point of view, like I said, exploring the this ancient fandom several generations back. But I am um, still considering that and discussing it with various people um so we'll see but the podcast thing was just that i love i love serial podcast and i love going back and resurrecting old true crime and how the the format of a podcast <laughs> true crime podcast is so distinctive if any of you have read sadie by courtney summers that does an amazing job of capturing that podcast voice um as they investigate a crime but even in Sadie, they have to have it alternate with an actual prose sections from the character's point of view as well as the podcast. So, yeah, I'm still thinking about that. Publishing is hard, <laughs> um, but I'm going to try and add in as much as possible of it. Tori uh, asks, how did you decide what format to use and when? Uh, for example, transcript, blog post or internet forum? Um, so I had a list of formats that I wanted to include and when my, I ha had a few readers that read early drafts and they suggested some. So like a Reddit Q&A, that kind of thing. Um, Instagram comments. I wanted to do more Instagram stuff, but I would have had to get more pictures because um, Instagram is so picture based Like you can get away with just having text posts on, um, on Tumblr, but you have to have some kind of picture on Instagram. So I would have included more of those, um, but I just didn't want it to be full of like very boring stock pictures for Instagram. But I think that there's such an interesting niche community on Instagram that I could have gone into a whole extra layer there of all the weird mummy bloggers on Instagram. That would have been a lot of fun. Um, so formatting was kind of it was partly like, what can I feasibly do uh, based on the fact that I can I've only got a few formatting tricks I can do. I can like indent the paragraph to lay it in different spaces on a page. I can use uh, underline and bold and stuff. Um, but apart from that, you're kind of pushing the capacity of what you can do in a typeset document. Not, not just in Word or on, on a website, but like if it becomes a paperback, you can't go crazy with the typesetting. Um, so some things were just not going to work. So YouTube comments is another one that I would have loved to do more of, but the format just wasn't be possible. Um, so part of it was, well, can I do this? And is there a good point I can make about fandom? Um, and um is it live is it talking about something that's happening live in which case it's got to be a kind of transcript of something happening or is it something that happened a long time ago uh what if it happened a long time ago what what kinds of internet websites were they using so was it a forum or was it something like twitter um so there was a lot of that went into it um i did a lot of reading about fandom <clears throat> when i was writing it so some parts of it i already knew because I was on live journal so a lot of the live journal stuff was just personal experience but going back a bit further I knew I wanted to talk about kind of very early Star Trek fandom so in the 60s and 70s uh, so I went and read th there's a university um, of the University of Iowa I think it is they have a lot of transcripts of interviews with very early like zine age fandom people just talking about their experiences so I read a lot of those and that gave me so many ideas for stuff that I wanted to include so Nessie Nessie um the fandom user who also got taken out by Rob uh on live journal with Gotti with Effie and Nessie's girl was based a lot on that 
uh, research I did about very early vintage age fandom when the, the internet was just becoming a thing and people were like using like um, email servers to send stuff back and forth um, because I think it's really interesting how people assume that fandom is for teenagers and that as you age up you kind of are supposed to leave it behind and yet there are people now who were on using who like established fandom in the 60s who are still fans now and that doesn't leave you and I wanted to talk a lot about how um it's quite sexist to assume that as you grow up as a woman that you should stop doing the things that interest you and you should just like get on with being a housewife or whatever um so that was something I wanted to talk about and the zines that Rob's dad had as well that was like I don't think I think that's probably gonna have to get cut out because it does not do anything contribute anything for the plot but it was really important to me that I got in that kind of example of a, a vintage zine just to show people reading it who might have no idea how long fandom has been around that this has been here a while and we're not the first people to do this stuff uh, I'm just gonna check if there's any other questions in the other threads okay uh is there anything that we completely missed uh kate asks <laughs> there are yes yeah there are uh you're gonna have to go back and reread it i think and now you know the kind of the theories um there are some things you didn't pick up on i mentioned um but nobody picked up on rob bribing the bribing the producers nobody had any uh, curiosity about that and nobody really I've not seen anyone comment on the fact that uh, someone thinks Rob bribed the producers uh, to get on a, a role on Lock and Ness um, I think like these days to get cashed you need to have connections and um, it's very suspicious to me that Rob is, is such a good actor that he got on a show that he loves so quickly as his first role so there's a lot there that I've not seen anyone pick up on about basically about what Rob did in between getting his money as silent wakes and then becoming a famous actor there's a lot of time in there and there's some clues about what he was up to that it, um, it would be interesting to see people have uh, investigate a bit more uh, M asks I know it wasn't the point of the essay but what Rob and Nathan actually together um, yeah i can't say <laughs> maybe i'll have to talk about it if uh it becomes a finished novel but i don't know i just don't like i don't want to talk about it because i think i feel weird about talking about it because it's not the point of the story and i don't know i think it would have a lot more connotations if i said yes they were definitely together and then i killed one of them off um so I, I don't I don't want to commit to it. They they could have just been roommates. Oh my god, they were roommates. <laughs> um yeah, we'll see. Maybe I'll decide one way or another. Uh I think that even if they weren't together, they they would you could easily get as much evidence as Gotti did about two men who aren't together but spend a lot of time together because that's what fandom is very good at doing. So yeah, I'm not I don't think that it would be implausible that they aren't together but we'll see um how did somebody uh not notice that there was a body there for three weeks so this is a massive la mansion um and rob was not there most of the time and apart from that it was empty so yeah i think it's just the fact that nobody went in the office in that time uh rob nathan was missing obviously because he was in the closet um rob just wasn't there uh so it just went unnoticed um well so Callista asks what do i think of mine and alice oseman's views of fandom because she wrote i was born for this and radio silence so me and alice are like very good friends and i but most of her plotting happens with me so so all of her books were plotted out with me um so our views of fandom <laughs> are very similar in that we we work together on our projects um like a, a lot uh, i think we have the same view of fandom in that we're kind of both positive and negative and that it's a great space to explore yourself and when you're growing up and your interests 
but people can go too far with it um, and that it can be negative if you just don't respect people as other human beings. Uh, but I think we were both trying to do our different things with those projects. So I was doing something different with an unauthorised fan treatise than Alice was doing with I Was Born For This. Um, <clears throat> so I was more interested in looking at <clears throat> the history of a fandom and how you can have uh, this mythology and how that can build over time and be uh interpreted differently by different people and kind of just evolved to become as true as what actually did happen because there's so many people who believe it whereas alice was more interested in kind of the mental health issues around being in fandom from the perspective of being um a, like a fan or being famous um Whereas like if I like I definitely have not really gone into how Rob feels mentally about being famous because like he loves being famous. He spent a lot of money and time trying to get famous and he has now generated his own fame through uh, all of this stuff he does. Like he acts in a certain way in interviews because he wants to generate this kind of shipping uh, persona. Like that's very intentional on his behalf. Um, so yeah it's not really so much about mental health for my characters and how they feel about being in fandom because they just love they love it they 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 love the craziness of being in fandom and gotti like she even says at the end like i know i've like helped people die and get deported but i enjoy it so much and people do thrive on drama and so that is kind of what i wanted to say that you shouldn't always assume that someone saying something is saying when people post stuff online they try to imply that they're doing it for moral reasons because they think that the information needs to get out there but a lot of the time i think they're just doing it because they want to cause up some drama and stir things up um so i think like this is the same as like looking at fake news and actually actually checking your sources you should always like make sure that you really understand the motives for why people are putting stuff out there we were both doing it together if that makes sense so um all of our ideas are kind of kicking back and forth off each other so me and alice have been friends since 2014 and like even back then i found a, do a, a document yesterday that we wrote in january 2014 that we were like having a go at co-writing a story together so it was about kate from the next together and tori from solitaire going on adventures together and we were just already like exploring what they if they had <laughs> so it was about them being friends on tumblr and meeting on tumblr before both books started and it was kind of about female friendship within fandom space so me and alice have been discussing this since 2014 and plotting it together and yeah 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 nikki kind of like writing our own fanfic um so everything that we write you, you can kind of see uh each other's influence on it Callista says she likes that uh, I've made Gotti writes an actual Tumblr blog and all the Twitter accounts are actual accounts that you can click through rather than screenshots yeah so I wanted it to feel very real and interactive because that's the best part of those kind of fandom write-ups is that you can click on one and it might only be 5,000 words but if you really want to lose a lot of time you can spend seven hours opening every single tab of every hyperlink and exploring all the blogs of the people on the hyperlinks and seeing all the comments and finding new people um like that's the best part for me is if i'm if i've clicked on a fan essay i want to lose myself in it and uh, I wish I could have done more. Like I said, I wish I could have made Instagram accounts for the, all the characters as well, because people behave differently on Instagram and they do have in Instagrams, but I just couldn't get all the photos for that. Um, so those are th that is why I wanted to post it online rather than do it as a real book, because I wanted to go through and have in all the layers of clicking on stuff and seeing how this spreads out across the internet. My favourite part was doing so uh, the the archive of our own account that um, you can click through to read all of the fix. I had to, I made that account and I put loads of stuff in the bookmarks and I 
put like I went and found some of my old fanfics from when I was 16 and added them on there, backdated them. So making like a work archive of our own account was a lot of fun and I hope um, people have explored that and gone in and looked at the easter eggs on there as well. What else have we got? <laughs> the feeling when you hold on to a grudge from when you're 14 and it results in the merger of one of your favourite actors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, she's living the dream. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know how like more um, store crew stuff in fandom doesn't get worse because people out there are very obsessive. My favourite story is that Rob Pattinson um, had like a stalker when he was filming and they used to stand outside his hotel and he just invited them for dinner and like <laughs> spent the whole dinner complaining about his life and they never came back. <laughs> so I would love to see that with <laughs> Rob and Gotti. I'm not sure who'd be outside the hotel. Maybe Rob would be outside Gotti's hotel. <laughs> Oh, what's up with Nessie? Yeah, so Nessie, who I've mentioned, is the, the old lady who's in fandom, who's there from the very beginning. Monty asks what's up with her. Um, yeah, she she kind of left fandom after that, which is a shame. Um, and the toxic new fans got in the way of her lovely history of being in fandom. Um, she was quite old back in 2014, so she's probably still just like looking after her grandkids, being an old lady. Um, the thing that I'm interested in is like what's Gotti up to in Delilah's time, so like 20 years later, <laughs> is she still in fandom? She said at the end that she is going to go off and make a, a side blog for a new fandom. So I love the idea that she's, you know, um, causing chaos in a different way, <laughs> in like a K-pop fandom or something, <laughs> and she has been for 20 years. <laughs> Um, how long was Gotti plotting against Rob, Nikki asks. Um, like a long time, so from the very beginning, as soon as he was awful to her as Silent Wakes, she's been trying to find a way to get back at him. So I imagine that every <laughs> every time she, <laughs> uh, Ollie's now wrestling me, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, every time that she gets like mad at him, she goes off and like Google silent wakes and tries to track down more evidence of his life and looking in the Wayback Machine for more stuff and she was desperately trying to track him down and then Rob made that tweet about being in fandom and immediately it was like <laughs> galaxy brain and she started working furiously 24 hours a day creating the essay so <clears throat> yeah she's she's been plotting for a long time and that's why it's got so intricate because like she's she's really had a lot of time to think about this and work out the best way to get him and take him down and she did a pretty good job like I don't know how much you believe she uh, actually did in this murder but regardless of what stage of being an actual murderer she is she definitely got Rob convicted I, I don't know if he would have been arrested if it wasn't for her because she was putting stuff out there that really pushed him towards being seen as the murderer that would not have been seen um, even if the body had been there would Gotti be a journalist now? Yeah, she definitely is a journalist uh, of some kind. I don't know if journalism will be the same in 20 years as it is now because of like the age of print media dying out. So um, she's going to be some kind of journalist. Maybe she's got like a true crime podcast herself. That would be fun. <laughs> I just love the idea of her like uh, even after Rob is convicted, she still hates him and she still is a kind of worried that someone's gonna call up her for her involvement in this crime so she's you know being very careful to keep an eye on the Gotti Wrights fandom. I, I, I think she becomes kind of inf infamous like my immortal she, everyone is aware of Gotti Wrights and makes like jokes and memes about her a lot and she just is just scrolling through the internet and casually sees someone talking about her and has to pretend it's not her. Um, was the snapchat message real clovella asks <clears throat> so in one of the last chapters gotti talks about finding nathan's phone and keeping it and finding a snapchat message that rob sent to nathan and then she's like oh and obviously because it was on snapchat it got erased so i can't show you or give it to the police and she then never gives the phone to the police ever um 
yeah so what does that tell you probably that wasn't real and uh even if she isn't involved in the murder she's definitely trying to you know make rob look bad there <laughs> she'd be very happy for rob to be convicted regardless of whether he did it or not um brad and anya um what involvement do they have um so they're both definitely lying in their interviews and transcripts at the end in that they both are like oh we had no idea <laughs> that any of this was going on we didn't talk about it with rob and nathan at all yeah they were involved for sure um they knew everything um and they just didn't want the publicity their publicists were like you cannot get more involved in this than you already are <laughs> so they had to um go back a lot but um yeah brad getting his forged documents off rob there's definitely more going on there and i think that rob would have been if if he got the part in lock and ness through bribery of a producer then why did he not do the same for brad because brad was struggling to get roles uh and would brad be resentful that that wasn't done for him yeah, there's something there that's, I think, of the involvement there. Um, but like I said, I haven't written that far yet. <laughs> uh, as the treatise was unfolding, what was the rest of Gotti's life like? <laughs> so she's just like a normal teenager going to school, um, hanging out with her sister and her mum. I, I think they thought she was doing homework. They definitely didn't know she was so deeply in fandom. Like, I think... Uh, most parents would be very surprised if they saw what the stuff their their children were up to online um even if they're not hiding murder or convicting people of murder <laughs> um so that was the big thing for me was that when i wrote the first draft a few of my early readers would say like Rotty's so mysterious is she a publicist at nbc is she actually a teenager is she rob and um, um i had to go in and add lots of details to prove that she is a real teenager like her amazon wish list and stuff because it's no fun if people think that she's older or an actual journalist or something the whole point is like this is what teenagers are doing online this is how clever they are this is all realistic um so yeah that was definitely a big thing for me was that she was a real she's a real teenager how long did it take me to write a chapter in the format it's in? So quick. I was writing like 7,000 words a day. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it took me about a week to write half the novel, um, like quicker than anything else I've written. Usually I write about 1,500 words a day, so three times as much as normal, maybe more, um, because of the format, because it's like an essay. <laughs> the fact that Brad and Anya were each other's alibis seems very suspicious. It would be interesting to find out how much they knew or were involved. Yeah, especially if they haven't told their daughter, Delilah, much about this. Um, like, what are they telling her? And what does she start this investigation knowing? Uh, there's a lot more there. Um, and I can't wait for her to meet one of them in, pe in person, like, obviously she's going to have to try and track down Gotti and she's going to go and see Rob in prison. There's a lot there. <laughs> um, how do they start about her feeling? How do they feel about her starting a podcast? Um, I got, like, Gotti and Rob both thrive on drama. Like, that's very clear. The fact that Rob goes in and like comments on all of Gotti's chapters before there's any kind of danger to his life uh, it's very clear that he just loves drama um so I would think he is delighted to find out that there's a podcast starting um uh, and he probably leaves lots of comments on the podcast as well <laughs> oh, I'm so excited to write more of it because they're they're just such great characters they're awful awful people and they're they're going to continue doing awful things for a very long time <laughs> until they're Nessie's girl's age. <laughs> There's another 80 years of this. <laughs> when do we get more? Um, I am working at the minute on a climate change thriller, which is coming out in September 2021. So um, I've got that. That's due in at the end of June. So I'm very busy on that. Uh, and then once that's done, I've obviously got to edit it. Uh, and then I will be working on 
Gotti. Uh, probably the next step will be I've got to write an outline of what does happen when Delilah starts her podcast. <laughs> um, and like I work as like full time as much as I can. So yeah, you're going to get lots of stuff from me. <laughs> but um, I think the best way, the, the things you could do right now to try and get it faster are leave Goodreads reviews uh, and pre-ordering Harriet Stoker. Uh, which is coming out in September. Will there be an actual sequel? Um, so it won't be a sequel in that it will be. It won't be a completely new novel. But what it's probably going to be is that um, the book, when it's in a paperback form that you can buy, the first chapter will be from Delilah's point of view and told like in a normal book. So her going about her life, um, and then she will discover Gotti's blog and so then it will alternate between her story and then chapters of Gotti's blog so the sequel will be um it, the, the book will be kind of a sequel and that it's set like 20 years in the future and Delilah will get involved in ways that uncover new information about her parents and about Rob and Gotti but it will alternate with the book you have now so you'll still get to have a paperback copy of an unauthorized fan treatise it might not be all of the stuff that's on the website because like i said there's a lot of self-indulgent things on there like the zines and the q and a's and stuff that and the, the very very long chapter that's just gotti's fic about what, how she thinks rob and nathan started dating that's like i think that's about six thousand words long <laughs> like it's so long that will probably have to be cut out but those are the bits where i was most interested like in a very self-indulgent way about um exploring how the people writing this stuff convince them that they're doing it for a reason other than the fact that they really fancy these guys and ship them together they quite convince themselves that it's like uh, an important <laughs> important thing for the world <laughs> so yeah i love the fic chapter so much as well but it's just so long so that will probably have to get cut out um when it's a paperback book but you will in exchange you will get delilah going and talking to rob in prison so you'll still get some cool stuff <laughs> that chapter was so suspicious because she didn't commit a crime yeah <laughs> uh, which is clearly a, um, as an editor like you've got good instincts the fact that she didn't commit a crime shows that it should have been cut out because it doesn't progress the plot and as an editor you have to be like we're gonna we've got to make sure that everything progresses this um so I kept it in there just completely self-indulgently because you know it's just on a website I can put on what, put up whatever I want um, and you want the world to feel massive and so the more the better really um, yeah I, th I think the thick chapter is really interesting because Gotti like I say she has so many motives and I don't think she even understands them all so if you asked her and she was gonna be in a mood to tell you the truth she'd tell you that her motive so that she hates rob and she wants to get revenge on him and then she'd tell you if you ask that well she has to get this revenge by posting this fan treatise because that will be how people pay attention to what she's saying and the things that people are interested in are shipping these characters together these actors together and then if you asked her but why are you writing this fic about them getting together she'd have to then be forced to confront the fact that she's not doing it for revenge reasons she actually does fancy Rob even if she hates him and she does think that he's dating Nathan and so a lot of what she's saying is like her her finding a reason to think about them being together without telling herself why she's doing that so uh yeah lots of complicated motives and i think that's one of the most fun things about a project like this is you can see that the reader knows more about gotti than she does herself and then gotti knows more about the reader than than they understand um and i think right <clears throat> as well i obviously have there's a limit to how many of the comments and i, I could include at the end of each chapter but if you look at the comment numbers there's something like eleven thousand comments getting posted on each chapter by the end so gotti is investing all her time in this like whenever she can she's there reading comments and replying to them and discussing this stuff with people so she is like fully invested even outside of the murder when she's not thinking about how to stop this murder being like um put on her she's just talking about rob and nathan dating for eleven thousand comments a week so yeah she's she's deep but 
it's just so nice that you've all invested so much time in like following along every week for 30 weeks <laughs> it's such a commitment and you've taken it seriously instead of like thinking that it was a crazy thing that like you've trusted for something like this you have to trust that the person writing it is good at writing because it's otherwise you can't believe that the stuff you're being told is a clue you have to believe that the person is a good writer to treat things seriously as clues rather than just random bits of advice so i'm really honored that you think that i'm a good enough writer that you are analyzing my writing and looking for those clues and discussing what was a red herring because that means that you like yeah you saw that i was doing things intentionally and i feel, feel so happy <laughs> that you, you you think that and I want to say as well that if you enjoy that kind of uh, analysis of looking for clues in a story, you're going to really like Harriet Stoker, my next book, because there is the biggest <laughs> plot twist in the world in that. And there are so many clues all the way through. There's another un unreliable narrator who's t telling you like commentary on the story as it goes along. And there are a lot of clues there about what's going on so yeah get excited for september i can't wait to see you all analyzing that one if you enjoy analyzing stuff oh, i look forward to it every monday as well i'm so sad like i've been in a depression all week because it's over <laughs> just because like it's so nice um having something come out in real time as well like usually i write a book and then I, nobody reads it for two years and when they do I'm sick of it because I've read it 80 times so having something be posted as I'm writing it and seeing all your reactions in real time and seeing the reactions chapter by chapter as, instead of like the whole novel at the end has been a lot of fun <laughs> you spent a whole afternoon writing a gotti as Effie Muriel theory that's so good um I loved that like like I said, it's such a compliment when people take your writing seriously enough to actually analyse it for clues. So I definitely love that you managed to guess that Gotti was Effie. Um, if you like, it's not like, oh, damn it, they guessed it. It's more like they've guessed it. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> like that's for me when I'm reading stuff. If I guess a theory, I'm not like disappointed that I've worked it out. I'm like, yes, <laughs> I managed to work it out. <laughs> Yeah, it was a red herring that she is m connected to Molly Garcia, but also uh, the, I included that as a red herring because she's kind of, Molly Garcia is the one most similar to Gotti within the story in terms of perspective because Molly Garcia is also trying to create a narrative about Robin Nathan and try and make other people believe it as a mythology and the only other person doing that is Gotti. Um, so yeah so that was kind of why i chose that character to have the same surname <laughs>